I've never been a big fan of these pocket multimeters, but I'm building a new troubleshooting tool bag and I just don't have enough room in it for a regular multimeter. So I bought this on Amazon. I thought we'd take a look at it, see how accurate it is, take it apart and look inside and see if this is something that may be a good addition to your troubleshooting tool bag. As you can see, the bag that I'm using is pretty small and I've got a lot of tools already in it. We'll do a whole video on that because the last time I did a tool bag video, you all loved it but I want to check this meter out and we're going to get our Fluke documenting process calibrator and we'll hook an $8,000 process calibrator up to a $15 meter from Amazon. All right, so this is the meter here. It's an Allo Sun. It's an EM3085A, and it was about $15 or so US when I bought it on Amazon. And just for a size comparison, this is the XTech EX330, which is one of our favorite meters. And this is a SparkFun VC830L, which is what SparkFun actually donated for our gears workshop. And then we have a couple around here as well. And the students actually got to take these home with them. So it's a great meter, but both of them are a lot more expensive than this, but the main thing is the size. You see this folds up into a pretty small case. It's protected, unlike having the, the selector switch exposed and the leads hanging out. And it's just quite a bit smaller than any of these meters. I can't get any of these to fit into my quick troubleshooting tool bag that I'm building, but this one will fit in the side pocket because it's so slim and I'm not worried about destroying it. So we're gonna take a look at it. First thing we're going to do, as Dave Jones would say, is we're not gonna turn it on, we're gonna take it apart. We're gonna pull these screws out, have a look inside, put a battery in it, and then we'll do some testing. But before we take it apart or turn it on, let's take a look at the case first. So we've got a plastic case here, probably ABS it feels like, and it has their logo on it on the back. There's some information telling us that we need to install a battery. We need to read the manual. Don't operate with the case off, uh, that sort of thing. And if we open it up with a little slider here on the side, a little bit of a creak when it opens, but we can see that we've got our mode selection wheel, which actually has a fair click to it. Uh, to select our mode, it would be nice if this marker was a little bit clearer though because it's really hard to tell. So in fact, what I think I'm gonna do right now is take a silver Sharpie and put a Sharpie mark on that just so it's a little bit more clear to me where it is and you can probably see it better as well. It says it's CAT2 rated 600 volts AC-DC, 400 milliamps max current fused. We've got non-contact voltage and it looks like the sensor for that must be down on this end. There's an arrow, auto power off, hold and function buttons. They're little clicky tactile switches under this film on top. Don't know how that'll hold up over time, but again, this is a light use, just real quick troubleshooting meter. You can get the case to lay flat if you push on it a little bit there, that's pretty nice. And the leads are retained underneath a clip here. It's a little bit hard to get up, but there are leads. Pretty small gauge wire and not uh, silicone coated or anything, just very basic. Uh, probably PVC insulation, but that's fine. Little small test probes with a little tiny finger protector there. But again, this is a small pocket meter. Am I going to recommend going and putting this into AC power in the wall or probing high voltage AC with it? Absolutely not. This is for checking what's the state of a solar panels output or a solar charge controller, or is that lead acid battery just totally dead when I'm in the field? This is just quick checking. If I need something more advanced than that, I'm going to be carrying along either my X-Tech or I have a couple of other fluke meters that I carry in different bags as well. But let's go ahead and flip it over here and take it apart. I'm gonna take these two screws out of the back case here Little number one Phillips. Let's see if we can get that to come out. There it is, all right. And then you can use the meter lead to press down in the, in the hole there. And there we go, popped out. Okay, so let's take a look at what we've got in here. The first thing I notice is residue everywhere. This board wasn't really nicely cleaned when it got done with manufacture. There's even some fingerprints on the piezo where it was pushed in. Yeah, just a lot of, a lot of residue that really easily 
scrapes off in there. So I would like to see that cleaned a little bit better, but overall not a big deal. Here's our battery holder. Fuse holder is a little bit sketchy. It's just a spring pressed up against a contact over here. And my main worry with something like this is that if we really take a jostle when we're going to the field or uh, drop it, that that fuse will pop out. But we'll see uh, what happens. The x techs are susceptible to that as well with the battery. We normally put a piece of paper behind the battery on those. We've got our blob chip here that's bonded right to the board. Let's see couple screws mounting it down, our piezo buzzer, actually have a metal e-clip here, uh, PTC on the input, some diodes. Yeah, there's really nothing too much to this. Uh, here's the, the wire for our non-contact voltage. And you can see just a little bit there, that pink, that's the zebra strip to connect to the screen. So that's just a pressure connection to the screen. But let's go ahead and put a battery in this and we'll reassemble it into the case here. case, flip the meter in, and we'll put two screws in the back. I don't expect a lot on the build quality of something like this. After all, it was $15, and that's part of why I say I'm not going to trust it with high voltage AC with me holding it on the other end. We've all seen videos of what happens with meters uh, that maybe were left in current mode and put directly across mains power. They can actually physically blow up in your hand. Don't know if this one would or not, but I'm not going to test it out. Okay, moment of truth here, let's turn it on. And okay, so we're in DC here. If I press the function, we're in AC volts, back to DC. I'm a little unsure of how this will be able to be read in the sun, so that's one concern. Uh, we're in ohms, then we're in diode mode, then we're in continuity check mode. Let's go ahead and do the electrical engineer equivalent of clicking the salad tongs. So we get a light, I actually like that quite a bit, that we get a little light. It's not super fast, as you can see, I can, I can click them together faster, but it's not too bad. It's not as fast as the X-Tech, but it's better than some other cheaper meters that I've used. And if we hit function again, now we're in capacitance mode. Now we're back in ohms. We've got a frequency measurement function milliamps, DC and AC, and our non-contact voltage. Okay, so I'm going to go get our Fluke reference standard set up and we'll see what this does in terms of accuracy based on something that is a NIST traceable instrument. Okay, so this is our Fluke 754 documenting process calibrator. It's a NIST traceable instrument and it can generate lots of things. It can generate current, voltage, simulate thermocouples, RTDs, all kinds of things. We're gonna use it to check the accuracy of this instrument. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this on and we're in volts DC, move my output leads over here to the source side on my Fluke. And we're set to source one volt and we're seeing 1.002 volts. Okay, so we're off by two millivolts. Not bad for a $15 meter. Let's do 10 volts. We're off by 10.02. And if we go, let's see, can we go any higher? Yeah, we can't go any higher on this. Maybe we can go to 15. Yeah, we can go to 15. 15.03, so yeah, we're seeing a, a little bit of a linear error there. But again, 30 millivolts on 15 volts. That's not something I'm gonna be terribly upset about. If we go minus 15, minus 15.04. Minus sign is a little hard to see. Uh, it looks like it's part of the, the DC symbol almost, but it is there. So you just have to keep an eye out for that, I suppose. Okay, we'll go back down to minus 10, minus 10.02, minus one, minus 1 1.003. And now let's give it something really small, like minus 20 millivolts. Okay, we're reading 19.8 millivolts, not bad. What if I do two millivolts, 2.0? What if I do a half of a millivolt? We're reading 0.5 millivolts. Okay, relatively impressive for a $15 meter, but that's just on voltage range. So we're gonna try out a few of these other ranges as well. We've already looked at the continuity check, but I'm going to now source, I'm gonna disconnect switch into resistance mode. We're gonna go back to our source tab and we're gonna source a resistance. And now I want to simulate, let's say one ohm to start with. 
and I'm going to hook the instrument back up. It's auto ranging. Auto ranging is a little slow. Reading 1.5 ohms. So we're off by quite a bit there. Let's try 10 ohms. 10.6 ohms. We're still off by a fair amount, you know, half a percent there. What about 100? 100.3. We'll go to a kilo ohm. 0.997, so we're only off by 3 ohms there. What about 10K? Auto ranging 9.96. 100K, now oh, we can't go quite that high. Can we do 50? No. Now 10 is about all we're gonna get, it looks like, out of this unit. Didn't remember exactly what the range of this was. We don't use the resistance calibration function that much, especially not in high scales. But again, not that far off. For a simple field, again, I'm checking voltages, I'm checking to make sure a connector is wired properly or that the wire's not broken. That'll do, that's not all that bad. Okay, I'm gonna disconnect it again. I'm going to switch it over into the frequency measurement mode and we'll do a one volt square wave, that seems fine. And let's start out at 10 Hertz. So something pretty slow here. I'm going to reconnect. And we're not getting anything over here. Let's try a kilohertz. Okay, so kilohertz is showing us 0.999 hertz. That's not too bad. We'll go down to 50 hertz, 49.9, 20 hertz, 19.97, 15, 14.98, 10. 9.98, so I don't know why it didn't pick that up to start with. Let me disconnect again and we'll reconnect. Reset it and clip back on. Okay, it picked it up that time. What about a Hertz? Okay, yeah, took a second to get the averaging to work out there, but 0.997, half a Hertz, averaging still working. Okay, so yeah, we eventually get there. 0.499, it just takes a little bit. Uh, what if we do, let's go back up to 10 kilohertz. Okay, 9.99, 50 kilohertz, 49.9K. Okay, so that's working relatively well. Again, it's not gonna be precision, but I'm impressed with that so far. Okay, now I'm going to disconnect it again. We're going to go to milliamp mode and we're going to move our leads over to the source milliamp terminals. We'll go to milliamp, source milliamp, and we'll start out at zero and reconnect. Okay, we're reading zero. Let's start out with something really small, like one milliamp. 0.98 milliamp, not too bad. If I go to a half, 0.48. What about 100 microamps? Okay, it's saying 80. Surprisingly, not that bad. Uh, again, you gotta start thinking about things like burden voltage anyway when you get down this low, but not too bad. Uh, we've got 400 milliamps maximum that we can go to, so we don't wanna do that or we'll have to blow that fuse and then go in and change it. Uh, so let's start out with going to something like 100. And okay, we can't quite get to 100. Can we get to 50? I know we can get to and at 20 milliamps, we're seeing 19.88. It's about as much as I can do with this because it's really designed for four to 20 milliamp process loops in industrial settings. But again, not too bad. Overall, the accuracy does not seem terrible, which is semi-surprising to me. I expected this to be off by maybe up to a 10th of a volt. I mean, after all, this is a pretty cheap multimeter. Okay, so let's disconnect it and then we'll see how it works when we go on a non-contact voltage. I guess we could also do, so if I turn my uh, source off here, I just disconnect it. We see it goes back down to zero pretty quickly. I'm gonna hit the hold button. And then when I disconnect, the reading stays there. It's pretty hard to see, but there's a little H that shows up up here at the top to indicate that we're in hold. And when I press the button again, we go back to our current reading. Again, my biggest concern is gonna be, can I see this in sunlight? In a lab, it's not too big of a deal, but in sunlight, it might be a problem to read. Okay, here we are looking back at the, the row of plugs here behind the workbench. And one important thing to note in the non-contact voltage mode is it has a little arrow 
it's hard to see. It says non-contact voltages down here. And it says EF, so I'm gonna hold it up here by these plugs. And I'm not really getting anything. Uh, what if we hold it via cable here? Okay, I'm not getting anything on the non-contact voltage on any of these cables. Let's put it back in that mode. Try it again. Okay, now we're registering. We got a beep and a flash. Not reading anything on this outlet interestingly, but it is here. On the cable, we got a much faster beep and flash. So does it work? I mean, sort of. Uh, would I trust that before I work on an outlet or something? Absolutely not. I generally don't trust non-contact voltage testers anyway, though I do carry a, a Fluke or a Klein or a Milwaukee in my bag generally. But as far as this, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't trust it. Uh, does not appear to have the issue that some meters do where when you tap them, they give you false positives. So that's interesting. But yeah, it's it sort of works, but that's not why I bought this meter, and this is probably the only time that function will ever be turned on. Okay, so what are my thoughts on this little guy? Well, you know, it's really not that bad for the money. Again, it's cheap. It's under $20, and I don't expect from a meter under $20 to get crazy precision. I was actually really surprised with how dead on the DC volts and the frequency. The resistance was really not that bad. It was probably the most off of all of them. Uh, the current was pretty good. So, and the non-contact voltage, well, we're just probably not ever going to use that really. But overall, I think this will make a good addition to my tool bag because as I said, I don't have a lot of space and I do like that it keeps these meter leads up out of the way. This is a little bit, clunky to try to get everything to fit in here and stay sometimes. But overall, if you're careful, <laughs> sometimes you can get it to close the first go. Let's try again. Eh, we're closer anyway. So yeah, that's probably if I had to pick something to complain about would be, would be my main complaint is getting the leads put away is a little bit tricky. There we go, now I got it to shut. Uh, the latch, I don't ever really want to fully lock it because it's quite hard to get unlocked, so I'll just kind of slide over halfway. Uh, but yeah, Owl of Sun meter for $15. I think I'll carry it in my field bag. Probably won't plug it into AC, but for doing quick tasks, checking cables, checking batteries, this is a great inexpensive alternative, and it fits right in the pocket of the bag. And for those of you that are tool bag fans, don't worry. I will be doing a full loadout on this once I get it all figured out. This is the TPLC from Vito, but here's the Allison meter and it goes right in that side pocket. No problems at all, hides away down in there. Can't really get it in any of the smaller pockets, but that's good enough for me. It doesn't take up a lot of space and it's going to live right there in my bag. I hope that you found this review useful. I didn't really intend on making a lot of tool reviews for our channel because we don't sell these. We don't get a dime when you buy them, but I wanna make sure that you have the tools that you need to do your science. And this meter seemed like a pretty good tool for that. If you wanna learn more about how to use multimeters, how to do troubleshooting, all the things that this is really helpful for, you should check out our Gears Workshop. It's a workshop we run once a year here. You get to come spend a week in our shop and learn all kinds of things from machining to electronics. We also can do them on site. And check out some of our how-to guides for multimeters. They're all linked down below in the description.